So every now and then you might see a, a lady pop around the corner just to get attention to cleaner or something. <laughs> All right, take it away. Yeah, let's go. So we'll start with um, your family life. So what was yours and Geelan's childhood like and were you and your siblings close growing up? Um, the it's important that you understand that uh, we were originally nine children uh, in this family. There was an eldest brother, Michael, uh, and there was a little girl, Karine, and they died young. Uh, Karine died in 1957, age three, from leukemia, and Michael, who was the eldest son, uh, was in a terrible car crash that uh, didn't kill him, but left him in a coma for eight years and he never recovered and died. And so what that meant is that the little girl was exactly between me and my twin sisters. And so instead of having a natural bridge, the family in a sense split into two because the age gap between me and my twin sisters is six years. Mm. And therefore Kevin and I and Gillen were, the, were very close as children and my four elder brothers and sisters were very close and obviously as we grew up in age we, we became equally close but it, uh, in terms of our childhood Kevin and I and Gillen were closest in age I'm six years older than her or five and a bit and uh, three years older than my brother and so we spent quite a bit of time together although we were educated uh, separately and um, so I've got pretty clear memories of uh, childhood with Guylaine. She was a funny little thing. Uh, she was very funny. That's a key thing. Guylaine's always been quite funny. She had a very good sense of humour. And uh, in terms of things that we did together, um, you know, we gathered about. She was in the same bedroom as Kevin and I for at least the first three years of our life. Uh, there's one anecdote that sticks in my mind. Um, is that we, Kevin and I quickly understood that the way to shock our parents was to use swear words, which generally got a cuff around the ear hole. <laughs> and so we thought if we could avoid cuffing, we would teach these words to Gillen because she was too small to be cuffed. Mm. And one day she's held in the arms of my mother, my father's next to her and some uh, worthy Oxford College head, head of Brazenose from memory, turns up and says, and who is this adorable little thing? To which Gillen said, piss off. What's <laughs> 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 a hell of a, my father was, didn't know where to go. Anyway, so she's always had a sense of humor. She always, uh, even as a young child, uh, loved animals. She had uh, dogs and uh, a cat and some budgies and a hamster and the pony. My father was rich and uh, could afford to give her these things. Uh, I thought she was perhaps a little spoiled because that's what happens when you're the youngest of the family. And also because her, the day of her birth, which was Christmas day, 1961, was only two days before my brother Michael's car accident. And uh, this traumatized the whole family desperately. My parents didn't know where to go. They were lost in grief and Gillen. Uh, was to some sense, in some sense, ignored really in the very early months of her life, even the first year or two. And um, there's another story told about her that at one point age, I think some two and a half, three, something like this, she stood in front of our mother, legs apart and said, mommy, I exist. <laughs> so it's kind of an amazing idea for a child. Wow. Um, so there may have been some compensation on the part of my parents. To, Felt, man, I felt guilty about, about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that's roughly the, my, my kind of encapsulated that's answer. To what, what was she like as a teenager growing up? Uh, she was, I think she was quite protected by my father. Um, and, uh, you know, who, who was very aware that, you know, she was quite uh, young thing and a, a girl with it and uh, following the accent of our brother all of the all of my older brothers and sisters were kind of corralled they couldn't go anywhere from you know they had to be escorted everywhere and 
my parents were really just so worried they were going to lose another child in some horrible way. So Gillian was in some senses quite protected. She went uh, to quite a few schools, boarding schools and uh, day schools. But she grew up pretty independent, uh, able to think for herself, do her own stuff. Uh, one incident I remember like yesterday, and that is uh, I, I'd gone on to, uh, to university at Oxford. We lived in Oxford. That was where our family home was. And so it was down the road for me. And um, one on Sunday afternoon, I guess Gillen would have been 16, 17 years old. The telephone rings in my parents' home. I'm, I'm, I, just, I was about to get the phone and I noticed that my father picked it up. Uh, and the conversation went something like this. Who are you? Jones. How old are you? Uh, yes. You want to speak to my sister? You're too, you're to my daughter? You're too old for my daughter. <laughs> so, father, uh, that was the end of that. She ended up going to spend um, uh, quite a few months in Spain in her year off between um, university and, uh, and school. She always had a lot of good friends, mostly girls, mostly a lot of very strong, close girlfriends whom she has remained with friends with to this day. That's good. No, that is good. And what, what was it like? So you obviously both grew up with a father who was in the public eye, um, very well known man. How, how did that affect your um, childhood and, and teenage years and dealings? Um, I think I can, I can best answer that the following way. Uh, my father really lived for work. He was I'm just workaholic's not quite the right word, but the, he didn't have any small chat. This wasn't a man interested in the minutiae of, you know, could I mean <laughs> what football team was winning or mm. he was interested in work and in matters of consequence and of substance. And we were brought up in this way. We had lots of advantages because uh, he could afford to give us those advantages, the most important of which was a damn good education. Mm. And he took the view, if, you, if I give you this education and I give you other things uh, to make your life comfortable, then you owe society something back for that. In other words, this wasn't just a question of take, 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 you gotta give something back. And uh, he therefore taught us from very, very young, the responsibilities associated with having wealth and opportunity and as a result of his uh, professional life, which was both political and business, there wasn't a Sunday in our childhood where we didn't have some big shots for lunch. I mean, there won't be much to you now, but these were some very serious scientists and maybe some labor government figures from the, from the 60s. Mm. And the children were expected to have something to say for themselves, know what was going on in the world, make speeches at the drop of a hat, entertain the our father's guests and so on that was standard and actually it was exhausting because we would want to come home on a weekend from school and chill and Big just yeah, have a nice time and that he was not in the let's have a nice time business you know i've got here the deputy leader of the labor party you're going to sit with him and have a drink and don't even so so it was a bit um it was that was quite pressured mm. and if we displeased him in some way and that was very easy we brought back bad results uh we ummed and erred instead of giving a straight answer to a straight question we didn't have anything any program to keep ourselves occupied bang you were you were in trouble and you know sometimes it was serious uh if you were caught if we lied to him and we subsequently discovered that i, I was belted uh and uh Gillen would have been smack not that often but that's the way he was brought up and that's the way that uh, the kind of stuff that we had to deal with so it was pretty it was pretty heavy i would say but at the same time he loved us i was never in any doubt of my father's love and nor was my sister he had lost everything in his life as a as a young man his parents were killed in the holocaust most of his siblings were put in the gas chambers. Uh, so his entire family was wiped out. He had nothing, nothing. And uh, he ended up having to uh, fight his way across Europe, join the British army, had a good war, 
-hmm. but he built everything from scratch. So family meant a hell of a lot to him. In fact, it was the only thing that did mean anything really to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he never let us forget it. And uh, so I would say it was a, a good childhood. We had lots of presents, we got holidays, nice time. But it, it was, you were never in any doubt that life was more important than having a good time. Yeah. That's nice. uh, so he instilled you with good ethics. One of the, um, I think that personally, the, the, the media and the press at the time obviously hounded your father. Um, it, it could be argued quite unfairly. How did that um, mould your view of the British press or the, the international press in general? That's an interesting question. Uh, my father had had an interest in the press uh, since the war. He was the uh, Allied press officer in Berlin uh, during the uh, in the, working for the Control Commission uh, after the war. This was uh, uh, the administrative uh, um, administration that Britain set up to run Germany or it, the occupied part of Germany that it was responsible for post-war. My father was in charge of. Uh, press relations. So he had an early exposure to the press. And then uh, he, he met some of Germany's publishers and, uh, and then learned very quickly about uh, the importance of science and then of science publishing and, and made his way in the world. And then he had a number of cracks at uh, buying newspapers in Britain, News of the World, Sun, losing, and, uh, losing on each occasion to Rupert Murdoch. And um, eventually gets the mirror uh, in 1984. But during the whole of our childhood, um, you know, he was an MP from 1964 to 1970. And there was this brilliant period of his life, really up until about 1968, I would say. He was, a Pergamon had been taken, that was his scientific publishing business, had been taken public. He was a very, very wealthy man, multimillionaire. He was a, a Labour MP. Um, you know, he was somebody who, who was a coming man. And then uh, he made a disastrous, absolutely disastrous sale of uh, the bulk of his shares to an American uh, financier, which then caused uh, uh, the whole of that uh, takeover to be scrutinized, the very first public company takeover by the then new uh, takeover mergers panel. Uh, he was excoriated. Um, and a famous judgment was passed on him that he was a man not fit and proper to be steward of a public company, which dogged him to the end of his life. Mm. And suddenly, uh, life was not so rosy anymore. I remember my parents were thinking they should take me out of school because the press was so bad. So if you like, the good press, bad press, it goes back a long way in my life, certainly to 1970. Mm. Uh, and uh, I... Yeah, my father was always very, um, not quite easy come, easy go, but he, he had a clear understanding that, you know, if you've got to go ahead in the world, you, the press is on your side. If you if you choose to uh, fight them, he, he was a famous phrase when he was running a newspaper and somebody wanted to have a pop at him. He said, be careful what you're doing, uh, taking on uh, a newspaper owner, because I buy ink by the barrel and I will have the last word, and <laughs> he often did. But it meant that we were quite scarred by some of this uh, negative publicity, and it was very, very bad. Mm. Um, and then he went on to have a very, uh, he had a really a, a renaissance of his uh, business life and went on to achieve some very great things, including the purchase of the Mirror and purchase of Macmillan in the United States and uh, football clubs, and so he bought lots of things. Yeah. Um, but he was quite protective of us, notwithstanding all of that. And I knew from the word go that I didn't really want to be in this limelight. I didn't seek uh, that. I know Gillen didn't either. And we felt really kind of not embarrassed by the whole thing. And mm -hmm. it's not for us. And so, so I, I mean, I was a bit ambivalent about it. Um, although I thought my father had was on the rough end of a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, attacks and some of which I think were anti-Semitic looking back yeah. on it, um, which were very unpleasant. But eventually uh, he had one saying, which was, you know, sticks and stones, 
may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And so he was, he had an astonishing hide of a rhinoceros and he could, he would ride that out. And, um, you know, if you're young and, uh, and easily influenced, it's not so, it's not so obvious how you ride it out and you take these things to heart. He didn't, he may have done, but he didn't show it. Yeah. That was the key. And so he obviously taught you to go, not necessarily your separate ways, but as you said, as, you, as you've said, to go and give back to society. Um, so, which you did, you you, you paved a, a successful career. Um, did you keep in touch with your siblings? So were your family still close? I know that obviously you, you did your different things, but. Well, following the, uh, my father's death and the, uh, you know, the explosion of our business and, uh, and then Kevin and I, my younger brother were uh, arrested um charged with conspiracies of fraud we had a, a a long long fight to uh, get to trial it last three or four years of preparation and so on and then uh, an eight month trial and we were exonerated at the end of it yeah. uh, during that entire time all of our family were highly supportive and remained so and are so to this day we don't know any other way than to support each other when you've had an alpha male like Bob Maxwell is your father. In some senses, there's an old Arabic proverb. It says, I against my brother, my brother and I against our cousins, my brother and I and our cousins against the world. Mm -hmm. So it's another way of saying blood is thicker than water. So yeah. yes, we have remained close at all times. And we don't need to be living in the same country or even the same town to remain close. Uh, you know, I think it's, I, we were broadly aware of the important things going on in each other's lives if not the detail you know we know you know you're going out with x or you're living in y or you're doing x or z or whatever it is that's fine so long as you're not hearing anything bad it's probably good mm. <laughs> and and so what about the path you, you say obviously that you've you sort of kept in touch you knew bits and bobs um what did you understand the path that Geelan took to be a career and her lifestyle jay you'll have to repeat that slowly yeah, oh, sorry <laughs> it's me no, um, so tell me a bit about her, the path that Geelan took, her career and her lifestyle. Look, um, I guess the period 91 to 96, Kevin and I were knocked out. You know, we were on trial for our lives. We uh, the Passports were taken, couldn't travel anywhere. Um, and it was a uh, very dark time. Ghislaine was getting on with her own life, mostly uh, up until then had been in London. She'd done a lot of, uh, she had a lot of friends and knocked around in, in town. But then somewhere towards the end of 90, she goes to America. My father had a lot of business over there. She started to uh, help with various, uh, some specific tasks, mostly to do with the newspapers over there. And then the business blows up and um, Kevin and I said to her, stay in America, don't come home because this is not a place for a Maxwell to be happy. Right now, London, England just turned on us big time, yeah. and uh, which I, I get, but there was no reason why it should turn on my sister. No. So we said, stay in America, get on with your life, do whatever you're doing. Um, and uh, you know, we'll just fight our battle the best we, the best we know how. I'm not sure if that's the answer to the question you asked. Yeah, no, I may have mis no, misheard it wrong. But no, uh, no, no, you didn't at all. To be fair, I'm quite nasally. So uh, um, when did you first hear that she was, she'd struck, struck up a uh, relationship with Jeffrey Epstein? And what did you believe that relationship to be? I, I know that uh, there's been a lot of sort of suggestion that somehow my father had introduced uh, the two of them. Um, I know that not to be the case. I don't actually know who did introduce Gillen to Jeffrey Epstein or precisely when that took place. I would say 91, early 92. Um, I, I guess I knew by, uh, you know, certainly late 92 that she was in, or early 93 that she was in a, a new relationship. Um, I didn't, uh, to be honest with you, uh, when you're engaged in fighting for your own life, as I was, yeah, there's not much else 
I'm concentrating on other than my own defense. My marriage at the time was falling to bits. It was just not a good time for me. So I didn't have much of a of a real insight into this relationship, except that it existed. She seemed happy. Uh, and um, and I thought, well, I'm glad somebody seems to be doing okay in our family, and I didn't think much else about it. Yeah. That's... Subsequently, I met him for the one and only time in 1996, and I'm not clear at what stage that relationship had got to by 1996, because it's clear that there was uh, a time when they were um, an item, um, uh, and then somehow they weren't an item per se. In other words, they were lovers, and then they were not lovers. And um, I don't know ex exactly at what point that switch occurred, and I think it was before I met him. But anyway, they were clearly still uh, friendly. And uh, I had lunch with him and Kevin and Gillen, and uh, my recollection of him was that he was an intelligent man. He had a certain charisma. Um, he was not somebody that I felt was instinctively warm as a personality. He, you didn't feel that this is a man you want to go and have a job with down at the pub. Mm. What I did feel was that he was capable of taking information from me, you know, sucking out think facts and ideas that he thought would be interesting, but there wasn't much coming back the other way. So he was a he was a, quite an aggressive listener. You know, there are people like that. You just feel, oh boy, you know, this is a very intelligent man, but you know, he's not really going to be my chum. So I didn't ever feel that. But equally, I didn't feel that he was some terrible monster because the key about Epstein was that he led a completely compartmentalized life. It's quite obvious that that was what was going on and that the life that he chose to show to me, to Guilen, to, to others, uh, must have been completely different and was completely different to what we now know to be his sexual and other proclivities, which are horrid and which are, well, we're in the mess we're in today for Guilen. Yeah. And what, you know, what was your reaction when he was arrested? I think when that happened, at first arrest, he was arrested, I guess, in about uh, seven or eight, 2007, 2008. Yeah. I don't think I had much of a reaction. I'll tell you why, because I know for a fact that Gillen had by then certainly moved, there was a new man in her life and had been for several years, perhaps from the early 2000s. So for me, Jeffrey was already part of her history. Um, and I don't think I'm, I'm I, don't, I don't think I ever really stopped to say, you know, other than it was a pretty shocking, shocking affair. Um, but he was already yesterday's news. And I'm not going to spend much time thinking about him. And actually, in the in the entire arc of Gillen's life, the sort of intimate moment with Jeffrey Epstein doesn't loom very large. Yeah. In reality, this fact it, been painted you, something else. That's you, my it's take. Like on a, a blip, does it? You know, just a another boyfriend, another friend that wasn't really significant. Sorry again, Jay. Oh, sorry. So, you know, the relationship, was it quite short? Did you not see it as um, very significant? I think, I think Gillen initially would have hoped that it might have become significant. Uh, as it has turned out, it's significant for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's come back to haunt her. Yeah. And I suspect that uh, you know, at the time she met, there would have been she would have been about thirty. You know, it's a time when you you're wanting probably to settle down and and to think long term. So, I I don't know. I it must have crossed her mind um, that that would be that he would be a, a possible long seriously long term relationship with her, to have with him. Um, but it it it's obvious that it was not. The reverse. In other words, he didn't want that kind of a relationship with her. They never lived together, Jay. Mm. He had his house. She had her house. He didn't have a key to hers. She didn't have a key to his. She wanted to see him. She made an appointment. So, you know, the, the idea that they're sort of some loved up forever couple, and that infamous picture of them almost joined at the neck, it just doesn't ring true because it wasn't that yeah. kind of a relationship ever. Yeah. And, and did she ever express any 
concern to you that she would she might be dragged into all of this upon Jeffrey's arrest did she think that she might be arrested uh, certainly not in uh, certainly not at that time I don't think so I don't think so at all I mean it's quite obvious now looking back on it and you know, hindsight is such a wonderful thing to have that uh, by the time you drive that forward to uh, the next let's say he has he's uh, he's arrested and then he's found guilty and then he's imprisoned and we're now uh, 2000 uh, I don't know 10 11 around there and one could might have thought that was the end of it but then there is this terrible uh, story that breaks in the Daily Mail with that infamous photograph that now everyone has seen of uh, Gillian in the background of a photograph taken in her house, which shows Prince Andrew with his arm around somebody we now know to be called Virginia Dufre. Mm -hmm. And um, so the whole thing takes off again. Uh, and But even at that point, it's hard to imagine that Gillian would have thought uh, anything bad was going to happen to her in connection with uh, Epstein. Yeah. I don't think so, anyway. And, where, and do you remember where you were and how you reacted to Epstein's death? I was certainly in London. Uh, he died in July 2019. No, August 2019. Mm -hmm. And it was a very... It was a strange time. We, the last time I saw Gillen and spoke to Gillen and hugged her was the 10th of June, 2019. I can date it precisely because there is a photograph that's now been released that shows all of the siblings together um, and with Gillen in the front and the rest of them at the back. And that was taken that night on what would have been the 96th birthday of my father, just coincidental. We didn't come together to celebrate that. It's a nothing day, but we were all in London at that same time on that night. And it was the first time for eight years, all of us had got together. And Gillen was in cracking form, just terrific. The whole family was happy to be together. It was so rare. And we had a nice dinner, and lots of jokes and reminiscences. And so I do remember Gillen being in great, great form, really looking good. Seemed to be in a great space in her in a, in a mind. And then fairly, that's June 10. Now we get to July 6, Jeffrey Epstein is arrested. I didn't really think too much about it. You know, he's rearrested. Gosh, that's strange. But anyway, and then the next thing, bang, on the 6th of August, he's dead. And at that point, I thought to myself, my God, how is that possible? How is it possible? for the US government to lose Epstein on their watch in federal custody, 24 seven under guard. I just don't know how that's, I remember just being shocked at how that could have been allowed to happen. I, I don't recall much else. I didn't make some vast forward guess and think, oh, Gillen's now gonna be in the frame. And I, I just, that was, I could not believe that a country as powerful and operationally secure as America could let a man die on their watch. Yeah, and, and it, there's quite a lot surrounding that. It just doesn't... At, at the very worst, it's complete negligence, um, you know, with the CCTV cameras, etc. But yeah. how, how, yeah. how did... How did um, do you know how Geelan reacted to her? Has she ever talked I, about his death? I can't imagine, I, you know, because I haven't... Uh, I just hadn't had, a, you know, there was no reason for us to, again to start talking and so on. And I, I don't, I don't know at what point she, uh, the press really turned on her case. And it must have been very soon after that. I don't think there was time for me to call her and say, what do you make of this or the other way around? And anyway, she's always led a pretty private life in America. And, um, you know, I wasn't in the habit of ringing up and prying and saying, what do you think about this? That's just not the way we didn't have that kind of a relationship. So I don't know how she reacted other than I assume with profound shock because it was just so unlikely. And the media, what, what they've done, is they've painted a picture that Gielan basically went into hiding, um, that, you know, she, she didn't want to um, talk to the press or anything. What's the yeah. real story about that, behind that? Well, the implication that's been um, put about is that 
she was running from the authority. That's that's the lie. And uh, the truth is that she was in fact running from the press pack and the lynch mob that had developed around that. You recall that the Sun newspaper put a reward of ten thousand pounds for a location of Gillette, a sighting, of, you know, proper sighting of her, leading eventually to a, a, an ability for them to interview her. But the intrusiveness of the press, the ruthlessness of which they tried to uh, locate her and were jumping out of hedges at her uh, home. Uh, they were sort of stalking the kids' school. Uh, they were seeking to, uh, you know, they had helicopters flying overhead. It was heavy, very, very heavy. And Guillen decided she could not inflict that level of intrusive uh, press pack lynch mob on her family. So she said, I'm just going to have to lie low for a while. And so we now know she was, you know, in fact, moving from uh, Air and B house to Air and B house, you know, for uh, many months. Mm. And then eventually she concluded this peripatetic gypsy life was not for her and it wasn't for her family. And they ended up getting a house in New Hampshire where uh, the, she saw quite a lot of her husband, as we now know. Uh, he was and his two children and they had some sort of a normal existence but the idea that she was fleeing because she had some uh, second sight that she was going to be arrested Gillen was not well there was no reason for Gillen to have been arrested at that point and um, in any event the uh, she was not as far as we know a, a figure of suspicion her lawyers were in touch with the uh, authorities said, listen, if you want to interview our client, we will bring her in. No such request was uh, entertained. And the next thing we know, Epstein dies. William Barr, uh, a, a rather controversial uh, attorney general, uh, come is film stamping his foot and saying he's livid and uh, uh, co-conspirators should not rest easy and all this kind of stuff. The next thing you know, she's arrested in this uh, ridiculous theatrical way with helicopters and FBI men crawling all over her property. And she's then been banged up for over 500 days. To me, uh, it, it's just crazy. And, and there was never any thought that she was uh, running away. If she wanted to run away, then she could have availed herself of either her British, or especially her French passport, gone to France, because the French do not extradite their citizens back to third party countries. End of. She could easily have done it. She chose not to do it. She remained in the United States the entire time from Epstein's death until her arrest, which was basically a, a year. Yeah. And, and why do you think she was arrested? Why, why, why has the focus shifted onto Gielan? I think she's uh, been arrested because the authorities are so embarrassed by the turn of events that they lose uh, a man on their watch in their custody uh, who is facing really serious charges. Uh, there are very, very many disappointed victims of Jeffrey Epstein out there who have been, uh, uh, who have, uh, who are no longer have got somebody that they can uh, address their case to, their anger to, their thoughts of uh, revenge upon and so on. He, he suddenly dis he's gone. The whole case against him collapses because he's dead. Mm. So the authorities say, well, you know, we 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 we, we are accused of having uh, signed up to a sweetheart deal with a man in 2009, 10, whatever it is, 10 years ago. And we shouldn't have done that because uh, it was clearly wrong. Uh, and now we managed to lose him on our watch. We cannot let things stand here. There must be a culprit. There must be somebody who's going to pay this price. Let's go for Gillen Maxwell. She's at the right time in the right place. She's a tri-national uh, and so on. And she's just a patsy uh, and being made to pay a blood price that she should not have to pay. And how do you think the media have covered the whole case? The media took their, their uh, line from the authorities. 
the day of Gilan's arrest, 2nd July, there's a, uh, later in the day, there's an infamous press conference held by the Attorney General of the Southern District of New York with uh, members of the FBI next to her. And from the moment that press conference begins until the end of it, it is designed to frame Gilan and to uh, put her up as guilty, guilty pre-trial, guilty under all circumstances. There's a terrible picture of Audrey Strauss, the Attorney General, acting Attorney General, I think she was then, pointing to a picture of uh, Epstein and, and Gillen, uh, Epstein with his hand around Gillen's neck, pointing for perhaps 20, possibly 30 seconds, mm -hmm. so that the evening shows can't get that picture. And uh, the FBI uses the most egregious language about Gillen slithering away to some fabulous luxury home and so on. It is designed and was uh, always conceived of to frame her as guilty. As soon as the authorities overstep the mark in that way, instead of saying, uh, we have evidence to believe this woman uh, must be arrested and uh, face charges and then eventually trial and leave it there, they go way over the mark and they do this. As a result, the press have got nowhere else to go. So they say, okay, yeah, she's, uh, she fits the bill. And they just go at it like hammer and tongs. I think that's uh, more than just uh, 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 the press taking the authorities' lead. I think there's also, uh, uh, although I'm not a conspiracy man, it does feel that behind this, there's also something of an orchestrated misinformation campaign uh, to uh, pursue Guilherme and continue to paint her in the way uh, that I've just described to you, which is just wrong, because if there is the evidence that, that, that's purported to be against her has never been tested, has never been, no, none of these uh, accusers have stood up in a court of law and had their claims tested in the way that they have to be tested, instead of which Gillen is already judged guilty in the court of public opinion, and that is not right, and that is what's happened in this case. And a lot of uh, what I've noticed is a lot of media attention has been placed back onto your father again, despite the fact that, let's be honest, it's irrelevant to the case. What are your thoughts on that? <coughs> Excuse me. It is completely irrelevant. You're right about that. Of course, um, when my father died, uh, it was then revealed that uh, he had uh, borrowed assets belonging to certain pension funds under his control um, in an effort actually to shore up the finances of the group. I have no doubt with the intention of returning those funds, but nonetheless, it was wrong and terribly misguided and it, it absolutely has cost it cost the business and it cost our family's good name so he has gone down now as a byword for bad for ba a bad man and therefore it's kind of it's such an easy link uh, and it's like hitting an own goal bad man the rotten apple never falls far from from the mother tree so it's easy to paint Gillen as, uh, you know, coming from the same old poison well. And then it's even easier to suggest that because he was a powerful, manipulative monster of a man, she's therefore inherently attracted to powerful, manipulative monsters of men. Uh, hey ho, she tips up into the arms of Epstein. And it's just the same old story. This time she's responsible for it. So it's a trope in some sense. And it, it is if it wasn't so serious, it's ludicrous uh, because dad has no input here at all. The, from my way of thinking, his strengths are all positive as far as Gillen is concerned in terms of her values, in terms of her work ethic, in terms of her creativity, in terms of her, uh, of her uh, capacity to do things. Uh, and so as far as I'm concerned, he's a force for the good. The fact that he's painted as a force for the band is just part of this narrative. Mm.
the, the wrong, the bad narrative, if you like, the, well, the negative narrative. I was going to say, it's any, ne any negative that they can find, isn't it? Um, so we've mentioned briefly about the fact that she hasn't been, um, her accusers haven't been scrutinised by the press, and that's true. So a lot of my work has been focusing on Virginia Giffray. Um, what are your, what's your opinion of Virginia Giffray and her, particularly her credibility? Well, I think there's only one thing you can say about her credibility, and that is that it is not sufficient for either the United States government to put her into this trial against Guillen, and nor has it been sufficient for the Metropolitan Police to uh, investigate uh, the events uh, which he alleges against uh, Prince Andrew, which happened 20 years ago, and, and which that famous picture uh, is, a, uh, is a symbolic of Andrew with his hand around her waist and Guillen in, in the background. So I think that's very significant. If her claims against Guillen were as strong as she asserts or her supporters assert or her lawyers assert, why have they not been used in this case? So from my perspective, that says it all. It means that were they to have been used, they could not have been stood up in a criminal trial. And why is that? Because if you go back through her own words in multiple occasions, both in court where she's on oath and in, uh, and in the media where she has given countless interviews mm -hmm. to press and to uh, in documentaries and so forth, the, her uh, words, uh, uh, recollection of events seem to change. Just take the example of Prince Andrew. When the Prince Andrew photograph and the initial allegations come out against him 10 years ago, there was no allegation that there was any sexual impropriety on his part. At least that's my recollection. And now suddenly it gets harder and harder and harder until suddenly at one, one minute to midnight when the statute of limitations is about to expire on this particular piece of uh, New York law that enables uh, alleged victims of uh, sexual, uh, non-consensual activity, activity to be lodged, she lodges this complaint against Prince Andrew and, and paints this lurid picture of what happened. Um, my own sense of it is that uh, she, uh, what's the most charitable thing you can say? She's very confused. She's a very confused young lady at one level because the story keeps changing. And uh, we know from her own testimony that she has uh, taken quite a lot of drugs, let's say drink and so on, which are unhelpful to having a clear memory, a consistently clear memory. And uh, I, it's, it's well known that, uh, you know, she also has um, done financially very well out of this whole, over this whole period. That's not to say that she may not have been victimized in some way by Epstein uh, and that she's not entitled to have some compensation and so on. But there is a big difference between uh, what I'm, you know, that, that specific uh, set of uh, claims that she may legitimately have and seeking to exploit the position, not necessarily in a clear, credible way as against my sister mm. and and what do you, you know so why do you think that media in general aren't scrutinizing this so that there's you know look, as i say i've a lot of my work has been highlighting the different contradictions and then there are there are plenty um considering this now involves a prince um we've had foreign presidents and your sister and it's one of the biggest trials um perhaps of the decade at least, why aren't the media scrutinizing Virginia Giffray and some of the other accusers? It's a good question, Jane. I, I, I think we can safely say that the media are completely aware of the inconsistencies in her account. Yeah. And they have drawn those conclusions quite a, quite a while back. So I think in some senses, she's already discounted in, uh, in the media. But we live in the age of Me Too. And 
the narrative that's been running against Guilin is at some level a, a Me Too uh, generated narrative. So for the media to go against that narrative on the one hand and to uh, uh, be seen to be victim shaming or taking it out on the victims is not a line they want to be seen to be doing. So it's, it's, it's rather awkward. Uh, they may not find her credible, but they're not prepared to put the boot in because their own economic interests and their own uh, perception of their uh, rectitude in the matter take primacy over justice and the presumption of innocence and so forth. And I'm afraid that's just the way it is. Yeah. And um, so we've covered the Me Too movement, which is, I, I feel, a massive influence on the case. Going back to Geelan then, but um, personally, have you spoken to her while she's been in prison? There have been, a, you know, there's been a lot made about her conditions in there. Um, have, have you spoken to her personally? No, I've, I've not been able to speak to her personally. And I suppose, you know, she could call me. She's got a certain number of calls, but these calls are listened to. And yeah. I'm not quite sure what she'd tell me. Uh, what I would tell her. And, and, and yeah. so it's much safer. If I've got something to say to her, I say to her lawyers who are seeing her every day, mostly by Zoom, um, look, when you're talking to Gillen, uh, ask her this or tell her that or the other, and then sometimes they, she comes back the other way. So there is some form of uh, contact, if you like, but it's it's at one remove or two removes. And, and um, as far as her conditions, sorry. So no, sorry, carry on. As far as her conditions are concerned, well, I think it's now it's now well known. And uh, as of just uh, last weekend or the weekend before, uh, in her own words, that her conditions are uh, really appalling um, and have been uh, from the word go. Uh, I I think it's fair to say that Gillen has been significantly uh, discriminated against um, at many many levels. For, just take uh, two levels for the. I think there was a strong misogynistic uh, side to this. Uh, it is uh, really extraordinary that the killer of George Floyd, John Gotti, a mobster, uh, Harvey Weinstein, Bernie Madoff, uh, Dominic Strauss Kahn, Bill Cosby, you name it, all men all of them appearing unremanded at trial mm. for fractional sums uh, as compared to the sum that, that Guillen offered for her bail yeah. of $28.5 million. So there is, why is she being treated differently to those men? One, so there's a, some misogyn misogynistic uh, uh, discrimination there. Then the conditions of her detention are clearly discriminatory. She, even uh, within MDC, yeah, she's isolated. She doesn't have the same um, access to uh, commissary and to uh, other so-called, uh, you know, um, uh, advantages that other inmates have, including other pretrial inmates. Mm. She is subjected to a uh, suicide watch regime. That's completely inappropriate. She's no more suicidal than you or I are, and uh, which involves inter alia having uh, a torch shone in her face every 15 minutes throughout the night that is still going on that is torture there's no question that is torture she's got awful food i think that's general in generally true in the prison uh you know the sanitary conditions are appalling the water is off uh i think she has many more strip searches than any inmate in there up to seven a day even though she's isolated from all uh, other inmates. So why are they doing this? They're doing this, I think, for two reasons. One, they're determined to break her. Break her spirit, break her ability to defend herself, break her mentally, physically, and have a show up defenseless at trial. And then I think they are also absolutely determined at all costs to make sure that the remains of Gillen are, de are delivered to trial. 
Yeah. Because they couldn't do that for Epstein. And that explains why all her bail applications have been turned down, all of them, even though the package that she's put together is unprecedented in mm. depth and scope and so on. That's another cause of discrimination. And it's not just the judge at first instance that has chosen really uh, for no rational reasons that I can see not to release her. But the appeal court above her has it on two separate occasions also kicked it back. So this is uh, uh, both a, a, a judicial decision. And since decisions taken in US courts, uh, you know, the judges are appointed uh, politically. Uh, this was a judge, Nathan was appointed by, um, by Obama. So you cannot say this is a judicial decision without saying this is also a political decision. Mm. And yet the judge has gone out of her way to say that come trial, there can be no putting up of the idea that uh, this could have some political implications as to why Gillen is being treated in this way. So it seems to me that the authorities here are bang to rights in every possible way as to the indefensible treatment meted out to Guilen pre-trial innocent by virtue of being a pre-trial detainee. They have bro and broken every rule in the book, uh, uh, including all, without exception, all of the key rules of the uh, uh, Nelson Mandela rules, which are UN, uh, UN uh, enshrined rules. And that is why uh, the family is going to, has taken steps to uh, lodge a complaint, formal petition with the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention in order to bring these terrible, terrible uh, uh, failings of the United States to broad public attention and to seek the um, the determination of the working group to hold the US to account and to have them uh, on the assumption that they accept that and can show independently that what I have just been telling you about her conditions are true, that she be released immediately upon the inquiry and completing, and that the United States uh, then conduct its own inquiry as to how that was allowed to take place and for those responsible for it to be held to account. That is what ought to happen much too late. Uh, and, uh, but you know, we're just not gonna sweep this under the carpet. No, that's good, that's good. And very final question, hand on heart, what do you think the outcome of the trial is going to be? Hmm. Look, uh, we've got to hope for an impartial jury. That's a quite a long hope because the drip, drip, drip of now a torrent of anti Gillen, two dimensional monster, pimp, uh, mother, blah, blah, what is so pervasive and so serious and so prolonged and so intense that it is almost impossible to believe that any member of the jury that is ultimately selected has not in some way absorbed that to a greater or lesser degree. So we're all human beings and uh, we've all got our own inbuilt prejudices and so on. So they've got to do, they've got to somehow act impartially. They've only got to look at the evidence that's put in front of them. That's already, you've got to shut out all that I've just been telling you about. And you've got to concentrate on that. You've got to somehow deal with your own prejudices, deal with all the negativity that you, you've heard about, and somehow concentrate on the evidence, listen to the accusers, and then listen to Guilen if she chooses to take the stand or anyway, listen to her, her defense arguments. And then if there is justice, Guilen will be acquitted because she is innocent of these charges that she is facing. And uh, that is my firm belief. I think that is also Ghislaine's firm belief. She's never altered her position. 
uh, in the defamation trial brought against her, defamation case brought against her by Virginia Dufresne in 2016, she did not avail herself of the Fifth Amendment. She chose to speak. That's now being used against her by uh, the judge in that particular case agreeing to release uh, certain parts of those transcripts, and then the judge in this case not you know, taking most of it in, and that one of these now leads to perjury counts that are not yet going to be tried, tried in the second trial and so on. So her attempt to be uh, open has been turned against her. And uh, so I, I, I think it's going to be really hard for her to get a fair trial. But if there is justice and if it's conducted properly and professionally and the jury acts as a jury should, she should be acquitted. 